So I got into this whole distinction between what we do in our growing system, whether we're organic or we're using chemicals, not so much to saying this is a natural material or this is toxic, this is broad spectrum and hits a lot of pests, but more from is it allopathic? Does it take out the pest or disease through toxic means? Or is it holistic? Does it build the body system? Does it build the immune function of the plant? Does it contribute to the nutrition? Does it contribute to that whole beneficial biodiversity? And that really helped me clear it up. Because I can do allopathic things in organic growing. When I spray copper or choose to use sulfur, I'm making a decision, and I hope it's a good one, and we've given some scenarios where it might be. Um, but mostly, I want to do things that build the system, nutritional things, things that replenish the biology, that competitive environment. And this is a good picture as kind of a storyline moment in our culture. This is uh, the 1930s, and those two are up there with their trident wands. I like the trident wands. They're not wearing any face masks or Tyvek suits. Neither is the horse. If you are spraying with a horse, by the way, the Amish make face masks for the horse um, today. <laughs> but they're spraying lead arsenate. Mm. And the national dose of lead arsenate in the 1930s was like 40 million tons a year on the North American continent. So there's a lot of lead arsenate has been put out there. And in some sites growing fruit for a long time, lead levels can be of quite a concern. So in going holistic, we're really emphasizing the health really of, of everybody, including ourselves and the horse. So to do this transition, to, to start a whole other approach to fruit growing, we have to change the paradigm, that clean slate mentality I talked about earlier, looking for that special silver bullet to take care of a problem. And just by understanding that the need for medicines, fungicides, insecticides, what have you, really springs from the fact that there are nutritional and biological deficiencies. So if we address those to begin with, that's going to be a huge leg up. In thinking anew about disease, there's two areas I want to talk about. One is the immune function of the plant, um, and second is how to create that competitive fungal and bacterial environment. Now I have a picture up here of echinacea. That reminds me to tell you <laughs> that when I fly to come speak somewhere, like here, um, I know I'm getting on an airplane. And I may get on that airplane in a really healthy condition. I've been eating a good whole foods diet and free range eggs. I've been getting eight hours of sleep a night. I've been meeting all the deadlines my publisher puts on me. I've been openly communicating with my wife, Nancy, about everything and sharing my feelings as a man. <laughs> I've I've been, uh, I'm getting on that airplane with my daughter, Gracie, totally respecting everything I have to say as her father. Um, I am just, I am a healthy organism. And yet, on that airplane, I am breathing the air of, sharing the air with three other, 300 other human beings, or 200, whatever the number is. And, and so, the chances of me encountering a pathogen are much higher, even though I'm a healthy organism in and of myself. And so when I get on that plane, I take echinacea. When I get off, I take echinacea, because that's something that boosts my own immune system. And the relevance to orcharding here is that every spring, our fruit trees get on an airplane. That's called the primary infection window. And that's a time when we need to do a little bit more to boost that immune function. Now, my human analogy for the competitive fungal and bacterial environment. I'm standing here in front of you, and how many of me do you see? Okay, I don't know what's in your water bottle, but you, you're, you're going with one. Um, <laughs> in truth, I'm standing up here as a community of one trillion organisms, mm. and my eyeballs, my skin is covered with bacteria. My digestive tract, my respiratory tract, covered with organisms. I, I'm just teeming with all kinds of things. And if I didn't have all those allies, if I was truly one, I would be a dead one. Mm -hmm. Similarly, out there, the plants, you just saw the compost tea being applied, well, their organism count gets depleted. It's not regularly necessarily warm and moist out there. I'm warm and moist. I'm pretty much a 
good consistent place to be a microbe. But out there, there's a lot more challenges going on. And that's another thing that we can enhance to keep things to the good. So this is Rudolf Steiner, who, uh, whose talks in Germany, Austria, back in the 1920s, launched what's known as the biodynamic farm movement. And that's a whole nother bit to talk about. I pull little things into what I'm, what I'm doing. But he said, everything in nature is interdependent, everything. And you've been hearing how those strands start to weave together. Now we're really going to see how the disease front comes together. When a plant is subject to a pathogen landing on its surface, it goes through a number of phytochemical pathways. And that phytochemistry is what leads to what I call the immune function. So first, it detects that these enzymes are being produced by the fungi to penetrate into the cell. That, in turn, leads to the plant doing an oxidative burst. So some, we mimic that when we spray hydrogen peroxide to, to clean up a disease potential scenario. That, in turn, leads to the buildup of salicylic acid levels. Salicylic acid is found in a lot of different plants. You know, as an herbalist, I know if I have a headache, I probably want to go find a willow tree and chew on a willow twig because it's high in salicylic acid levels. Back in the 1800s, a guy named Dr. Baer figured out how to synthesize salicylic acid. That's where Bayer aspirin comes from. So it's common. There are products that you can buy high in salicylic acid levels that are meant to push this process into high gear. And then finally, plants produce all sorts of compounds under the banner of secondary plant metabolites. A lot of that we don't understand. A lot of that is what we utilize in herbal medicine because it does certain things that we're tuned into as herbalists. But in the case of plants, we call those compounds phytoalexins that are produced in response to pests and disease attacking the plant. So that's what the plant goes through. That's kind of a big picture view of it. So in working with immune function, there's, there's two things I'm going to be tuned into. One is that the presence of some disease is good. That's kind of a really flipping of the paradigm. But that presence of some disease triggers the plant to get into gear to produce these phytochemicals. And secondly, I can tune into the fact that certain herbal constituents, biology, and trace minerals in some instances can further trigger this response. So the first business about a tad of disease being good, this comes under the banner of what is called systemic acquired resistance. And not only does a plant in this corner of the garden get infected, and it starts to signal throughout the plant that this disease is present, but because of the mycorrhizal fungal connection, other plants are told, be on alert, start producing this response. So this is why, the, this is one of the reasons that a little bit of disease is a good thing. And when that phytochemical response is launched, there are hundreds of combinations of synthesis that takes place. You know, a lot of this is beyond our understanding. At this point, we know about 350 of these substances. So when I talk about terpenoids and isoflavonoids, they're in the groupings of, of what I'm going to be looking for to use from an herbal medicine to stimulate further production of the same. Balanced mineral nutrition is a big part of this. You know, we started off talking about healthy plant metabolism. This really keys to minerals being available. Then there are other components of plant chemistry that can suppress this response. So here I'm talking basically about protein breakdown and polysaccharides, uh, those plant sugars not being processed further into proteins, complete proteins. And that goes right back to the biology and how everything happens in plant metabolism. So that response, that healthy response, can be suppressed by not having the biology right. You know, the, all those connections we talked about earlier. I have this, these green men plaques on the wall of my barn where I sell the apples. And a lot of times the green men have something to say. And this green man says, what do spots have to do with healthy apples? That's meant to trigger the customer asking me the same old question. Then I push this button in my neck and I give this 40 second response. <laughs> we all know the saying, an apple a day will keep the doctor away. 
And maybe that was true in the 1880s when it was first created. But today, depending on how that apple is grown, it may be that it takes 32 apples a day to keep the doctor away. It may take 68 apples a day <laughs> because unless the plant responds to disease, it doesn't produce the phytochemicals that in turn are the basis of that saying. And then I go on to say, you're lucky that apple has a spot. <laughs> you're lucky that apple has two spots. I mean, I don't want it overwhelming. I don't want it like a wall of scab on the side of the fruit and it's all deformed, mm -hmm. but a few spots are okay. And people have to face up to spots. And once they tune in a little deeper, I mean, you don't even have to do this, but <laughs> just taste the fruit. Mm -hmm. And they get into the, oh my God, I didn't know there was this flavor in the apple. I didn't know it was, oh wow. And you'll see people eat that apple to the tiniest core because it's filled with nutrients and it's filled with good stuff for us. That brings to mind the idea around here where a lot of apples that aren't sprayed can have fly speck and tree mold. And I don't know if you have ideas around those, if those really need to get removed well or not that big a deal. Uh, we, we are going to get to those. Okay. And I'll, I'll wait till I get there so people know what it looks like. So there are some limits to systemic acquired resistance, uh, just in the fact that pathogens and pests can start to switch their own chemical cues, their, the dynamics going on here. And whether they can tolerate higher levels of phytoalexins, suppress their production, avoid the giving the response at all that starts this process, things change. And I'll give an example of that soon with, with, with respect to scab. And then another thing that happens, and I learned this really deeply last year, a prolonged period of wetness and cloud cover means a lot less sunshine, a lot less photosynthesis. And that means that the phytochemistry isn't as engaged. And that can often be an op not an opportunity, a place where we need to go back to our medicines and maybe a sulfur spray or two makes sense because we can't really implement what's going on here or the copper sulfate on the tomatoes. I mean, the, the, this is not like every year is the same, and, and here's the prescription. It's you have to get involved with this, and you start to learn how it pieces together. It's, it's <laughs> the picture is goats. The point is goats and fruit trees don't mix, <laughs> for anyone who doesn't know that. <laughs> we go beyond that to the notion of inducing systemic resistance. So here we are using particular compounds through sprays to trick the plant into sensing it is under attack. Um, and it responds with that same phytochemical pathway that it would to a, a disease or a pest. And these kind of approaches are so dependent on having that healthy ecosystem in place, that forest edge ecology, all those things that flow out of that. In a way, we can think about this as kind of like a vaccine for the plant. We're mimicking the pest and disease attack um, in a nutrient biology-based way, but the response is to increase the phytoalexins. You know, one of the things that also comes into play here, if you prune your tomatoes or suckers, that mechanical wounding produces an electrical response that increases the biosynthesis of jasminate hormone, and that's what the plant produces more phytoalexins into response to. And there's actually people who use electrical stimulation on certain plants to achieve the same response. So the point here is there's many different pathways to going about this. And when we use different foliar induces, inducers, we are involving more pathways. And that's so different than genetically modified organisms trying to change, alter just one dynamic. When we approach it in a multiple way, we have a much bigger ability to, to deal with that array of diseases that comes onto the scene. And one other aspect of this is the response to this approach lasts on the order of seven to 10 days in the field. So when we get into looking at this spray plan, um, I'm gonna be addressing how infection windows ties to the lasting of that. So what kind of things can be used? Um, many things induce this response. So non-pathogenic bacteria, uh, bacillus uh, species, which are used in spray products like Serenade, 
or when I get to teaching you about effective microbes as the lactic acid bacteria, they induce this. Um, certain chemical constituents produced by plants attacked. So in the case of Japanese knotweed, there's resveratrol. And you can buy a spray product called Regalia, or you can learn how to work with that herb and draw out that principle to use it yourself. And I, I really like that approach, and we're going to get into the herbal teas. Um, the terpenes are a really important element that I'm going to bring forth. Biology, be it compost tea or effective microbes or a mixture of those, a very important piece of this. Um, minerals, and particularly sea minerals. So sea crop is a particular product where that can be drawn. Seaweed, the kelp. Again, there it's going to be isoflavonoids that we're talking about. But again, I'm talking about multiple activators, but a lot of these are also nutritional. So we're at the same time we're boosting the health of the plant through good nutrition. And then finally, humid acid ac extracts. So one of the key things that I'm using currently, and for a couple of reasons, is pure neem oil. Now, neem does not grow in northern New Hampshire. It doesn't grow here. This is a, a tree that grows in India and Southeast Asia and northern Africa and southern Florida, southern California. And as things warm, maybe you'll be growing neem here and I can trade with you. But for me, this is in the category of, of fair trade that I need. I don't, well, I like to use just like coffee. And I have a source for that through neemresource.com that I like the way they go about doing business. The reason I'm using neem, um, my one kind of non-indigenous remedy, um, is it because it contains three things. One are a series of terpenoids which induce that systemic resistance response. Now, I can do that with other plants in this ecosystem, but neem has that. Another is that neem contains a lot of fatty acids. So as we learn about fatty acids, it's really about fueling the good microbes. So when I talk about spraying compost tea, I also want to feed that. When I, when I build that compost food web, I want to feed that. This is one of those foods that does that. And finally, neem contains um, seven different azoduractins, which inhibit the molting cycle of insects. So over the course of time, the molting cycle being going from egg to larva to pupa. So it's not going to affect an adult insect, but it's going to affect the development of that insect to getting to be an adult. And we'll go a little further with that in a little bit. Um, but that's what I'm getting out of using neem oil as part of my holistic spray. So now I want to flip to the competitive colonization part, and then I can bring them both together. So we talk about the soil food web, talk about the compost food web. There's also an arboreal food web, and this is where that competitive colonization comes in. But it's even more than that. Um, in the soil, we know that microbe eats microbe. We know that the uptake of nutrients is very much in the hands of the biology. And yet, for most of us, when we talk about foliar feeding, we think about a mineral element going directly through the stomate into the plant. That happens. But mostly, it needs to be processed. And the biology that's on place on the surface of the leaf is part of the delivery mechanism of foliar nutrition. And that's often overlooked. Um, the key part here is that when a plant surface, be it the fruit, be it the leaf, is colonized on the order of 70% or more, that fungal pathogen, that bacterial invader, does not have a chance to outcompete and get established. So keeping it at 70% or more is the goal. Out there, where there's all kinds of factors working against microbes, colonization can drop to as low as 2 to 3%. And that's where disease has that opportunity to get in. So some of those factors we can't do anything about. Ecological stresses like extreme heat or ultraviolet ra radiation or acid rain, that happens. On the other hand, some of our agricultural choices play a big role here. So if we're using nitrate fertilizers to really pump up yields and produce emptier and emptier fruit, <laughs> that's a soapbox statement, uh, or using fungicides, which are wiping out the good fungi, the good microbes, um, we're also decreasing it because of our belief system, our, our thinking of what it takes to, to make a living at this or to grow food for our family. And then there's another factor, and that's 
that food resources can run out on the surface of the leaf. So the exudates, the waxy exudates that make the cuticle, microbes feed on that. Some things come with the rain, but eventually that surface doesn't necessarily offer what's needed for food resources. So when I talk about fatty acids, I'm <coughs> focusing a lot on that food resource aspect. So P Patrick talked about Elaine out there, but she w she's the woman who's really brought an understanding of the soil food web and of compost tea into vogue. And she points out, you know, we don't know which specific organism does this or that. It's the diversity that creates these dynamics, creates competitive colonization. And that's what our goal is. And, and if in time we learn about this particular bacteria doing this, that'll be great and interesting, just like we know about macrocentris, that braconid of the oriental fruit moth. Um, but mostly, a lot of it we don't know. We just know diversity works. C competitive colonization. So to really bring this point home, um, I want to tell you the story of a tree and a particular disease pathogen that was just waiting for us as a species, the human, to wake up to understand how to help this tree. And this really comes under the banner of what I would call probiotics for trees. So probiotics, some of you are familiar with that. If you are, for some reason, just familiar or I have to take a break? <laughs> or a question? Okay. <laughs> right. So fermented foods, or if, if you for some reason you're put on antibiotics, hopefully you know, go eat whole yogurt because it has microbes in it that'll reculture your, your system. Um, and I'm, I'll go from this story to teaching you about how I, what I use for that. So there was a tree um, back at the turn of the previous century that was the dominant species in the Appalachian forest, the American chestnut. And this was a tree that was really like the redwoods of, of the west coast. This was our east coast giant. And there's, there's little humans <laughs> in this picture at the base of these trees. But long about in the late 1800s, early 1900s, they brought Chinese chestnuts into Central Park in New York City. And with that Chinese chestnut came a pathogen organism that caused chestnut blight. And that chestnut blight, over the course of the next several decades, would go on to kill the majority of chestnuts. And you do not find chestnuts in the wild anymore unless it's a very, very isolated pocket. And all during this time, when chestnuts would die back to the ground, they were offering a teaching. But it took a while for us to hear it, to see it, to understand it. And that teaching was that the tree did not die entirely, but that stump sprouts would arise. And those sprouts might live to be 20, 25 years, just get to the point of bearing nuts again when the blight organism would come back through and kill the tree back to the ground. But it couldn't kill the tree entirely because right at the ground, at that soil interface, that foreign organism that caused chestnut blight was me meeting the North American soil food web. And it easily outcompeted the organism. So to go on from there, um, people have been back crossing the American chestnut with Chinese chestnut and now more crosses with American chestnut so we can get back a little more true to that. And during that process of getting each generation of these trees to start having nuts so we could back cross it, the blight would come on. And all people have to do is bend over <laughs> and pick up a handful of soil and rub it in the blight. And now the food web is up high and that organism just succumbs because it can't deal with competition. So that teaching um, is a big part of how I fell into understanding why we need biological reinforcement as part of our management of the fruit trees. This is the surface of a leaf and the leaf is upside down. That's the vein of the leaf. Leaves have these little root hairs that we most, are leaf hairs that we mostly can't see. Um, but in this picture, you can see the individual cells that make up the leaf, including the stomates, which is where the leaf trans respires. We're going to zoom in, double the magnification, and go on to the surface of a single cell. This is what 70% plus colonization looks like. Those are bacteria in the foreground. They're not diseased bacteria. They're just benign organisms. 
Those are yeasts, and those are the hyphae of the yeasts. They seem to be floating because to magnify to this degree is distorting. But that's the kind of place where if you're a disease organism and land in the midst of that, you just want to say, beam me up, Scotty, because <laughs> I can't make it here. This is not going to work for me. So we want that kind of colonization in place. So where Patrick showed you compost tea, what I utilize for the most part is something that comes out of the natural farming movement in Japan called effective microbes. And, and this is a mixture of three different groupings of organisms. Some formulations have 14, 16 species, some have 10, 12, but they're basically either photosynthetic bacteria, lactic acid bacteria, and single-celled yeasts. And these are our grouping of organisms that are we can divide the microorganism world into the aerobic species and the anaerobic species. That's why you brew the compost tea with the bubbler uh, to get a certain kind of response. This particular grouping of organisms are what are known as facultive, and they have the ability to both reproduce in an anaerobic environment, but also to thrive in an aerobic environment. So when I brew them without a bubbler, <laughs> um, the response is known but when I put them out on the leaf, they also thrive. So they, they have that ability to kind of step into both worlds. One of the other things about effective microorganisms is I can brew them by feeding them molasses and do this in a specific way. This is what is known as activating the culture and get 22 times, again, as much volume. So I buy a five-gallon container, which is enough for me to do my three acres of orchard through the whole season, but I brew it and that means that I end up with 110 gallons of activated microbes. So as a home orchardist, you don't have to go through that step, but commercially, it's a big financial savings to be able to, to take that and utilize <coughs> this that way. Yes? Um, you mentioned, you, you just mentioned that some of that research that you're looking at that came out of Japan. Um, there's also uh, research in Japan from the human medical community, the doctors, have determined that there's just a lot of different aerosols that teas give off the natural antibiotics and so forth, and the fungals and the viral all of that, to the point where there's now doctors that prescribe chlorophate in, in Japan. Do you know if there's been any interface between the, the or any conversation <laughs> about what comes off of teas that would be beneficial for other trees because in the fruit, in the fruit trees? I've only recently started to read about that concept of forest bathing and the aerosols. So right. my answer is no. I haven't learned enough yet to have found something to share in that area. Yeah, it's really, it's almost like that, that research is in the closet. <laughs> But no, again, there's so much in diversity. Anyway, photosynthetic bacteria. One of the things that they do is synthesize food resources, basically from the air. That's an important part of the team because someone has to supply this competitive colonization. Lactic acid bacteria, we're familiar with. If you eat pickles, you make sauerkraut, it preserves those foods. It preserves those foods because it can prevent spoilage, which means it has some action on the pathogen front. In turn, another really key part of the lactic acid bacteria is it helps facilitate the uptake of calcium and phosphorus. So those are two big elements we talked about in terms of the soil, but getting them into the leaf, getting them into the fruit has been tricky for growers. And here's this bacteria that does part of this work. And then yeast, I basically think of as the crowd, but yeast play a big role in, in this picture as well. So when I activate microbes, it's, it's not unlike growing beer not growing beer, making beer. And <laughs> this involves taking, in the case of one gallon, three quarters of a cup of mother culture and three quarters of a cup of blackstrap molasses as the food. In the case of my barrel, I make it by the barrel now, I will put two gallons of microbes, mother culture, two gallons of molasses, and fill the barrel to 44 gallons. That's the 22 to one. And for the first couple days, I want the temperature to be on the order of 95, 100. And that's because that's what's going to wake up the lactic acid bacteria. Now, you don't have to heat it, but then the process might take four to six weeks, particularly if you're doing this early in the spring to 
time it for the orchard use. Um, from there, I go on to keeping it on the order of 75, 78 degrees for another five, six, seven days. And once the pH starts to drop to 3.5 or lower, that's when I know it's ready. And, and just like Patrick pointed out how the compost tea has that sweet, earthy smell, the microbe formulation gets back to that sweet, earthy smell point as well. And so it's, it's rather simple to do. You know, if you're doing it on a gallon scale, it's like a cooler and hot water bottles. I have a little heating belt that I can control the temperature in the barrel and put it under a sleeping bag. So once you get it set up, it's, it's not that complicated. So it might be in your handout, but on top of that, I have a website called GrowOrganicApples.com, and on there there's a grower resource page, and the two sources of effective microbes are Terraganics and SCD probiotics. So a lot when I mention a product or this or that, you're going to find a link on that page for many, many of those things. So there is also the compost tea approach, which is a, a whole nother beast, but it's also, once you get into it and you set up the bubbler and you understand it has a temperature requirement and there's certain foods that make it work, you can go that route. For me, the home orchardist, um, effective microbes is just a simpler place to start. And I think probably the ideal is a mix of compost tea and effective microbes, because diversity, it's all about diversity. We don't know which is the right particular species. And then what happens? Yes, Patrick. I just want to say that since you've been here, I realized we should really be putting the EM in our compost tea. And it's just crazy that we weren't doing it. I just kind of forgot about that. But I think it's obviously the greater the, the greater the diversity, the better chance it's going to be the right mix. So then what happens? We get the crowd back in place. Some of those organisms that we've just sprayed on there may be even instantly consumed. They're part of the food resource. Some of those organisms might consume some of the remaining organisms still there or might consume the pathogen. Um, some of those organisms, in response to the presence of these new organisms or vice versa, might respond with certain antimicrobial products, antibiotics, fire blight. It's, it's the way nature, it's the way the microbe world works. So it's either one eating another, uh, serving as a food resource, crowding out another organism, or producing compounds that in turn limit the ability of the pathogen to thrive. And we don't know that answer. You have to be comfortable not knowing everything. And that's okay. <laughs> what has to count is, does it make results happen? And I'm seeing that happen, and others are seeing that happen. And that's the whole kind of biological reinforcement part. So we got here by flipping the paradigm, by thinking about a whole other way of viewing how nature works, what we can do to supplement that. That's a great Einstein quote going in that direction. Then there's genetics, and I just include this because it's an interesting little side note. I just talked about the multiple mechanisms that different foliar inducers bring us on the induced systemic resistant front. Um, but there's also those plants that resist cedar apple rust or pears that resist fire blight. And in the case of apple, there's a specific strain, a series of cultivars, which are known as the disease resistant cultivars, DRCs, which basically just stands for scab immune. And that is because they're all derived through crossbreeding from a tree that first grew at Purdue University uh, back in the early 1900s, a Malus floribunda tree. And that particular mother tree contains a gene, which we now call the VF gene, which has a hypersensitivity to apple scab. So when that spore lands on a leaf of a DRC cultivator and sends out its hyphae and penetrates into the cell because it stayed wet long enough, that cell instantly dies. And so that fungal organism, the disease organism, has no food to continue. So getting the food is what's called an infection. That's the initiation of an infection. So any apple prod prodigy of this mother tree that contains the VF gene is going to be immune to scab. But that's only in theory. Right from the bat, these cultivars did not work in Europe because scab over there is a little bit different. And organisms have that ability to change and be different in different places. Some of these uh, cultivars 
When you hear names like Prima and Priscilla and Williams Pride and Enterprise, there's a PRI in there. They were developed out of collaboration of Purdue, Rutgers, and Illinois University. And then other cultivars were developed at Geneva, so liberty and freedom come from there. Some were developed up in Nova Scotia, when we talk about Nova Spy and any of the Nova series. They all have the genetics of this original mother tree. About six years ago, SCAB evolved out in, at Purdue University, and the mother tree had SCAB. This is after 100 years of breeding this particular genetics into it. And what has happened is that in the last several decades, growers who planted the scab-resistant ones tend not to spray sulfur or the fungicides because they're not needed on these varieties, but often they're growing the other varieties as well where they do spray them. And we've created this great mutation ground for scab to deal with these two different scenarios. So it has evolved into a different strain. And so scab has shown up on these varieties in New Hampshire and Pennsylvania, and, and it might come to you. And so my advice is, it's a great thing, and if you really, really like the apple, you should grow it like pristine. It's an early summer apple. There's the PRI. It's really, really good. Williams Pride I like a lot, too. Some of them I don't like. They have really thick, tough skin. But I don't rule out growing any variety because that's a singular pathway. It's not going to work in and of itself. Another th yes. Three more slides and then we'll okay, do it. Sure. Another thing we do is, is here's a sweet, uh, sweet pear and here's this really sweet pear. Let's cross them and grow an even sweeter pear or the apples you mostly see in the supermarket, sweeter and sweeter. Well, as we've done that, we've gotten away from the genetics that are probably able to resist disease and that more. So that's also kind of screwing us up. And the notion of going back to the original source of the apple, going back to Kazakhstan, using apples like the Worcester Permain, which has a broad resistance to many diseases, not just the VF gene. When I talked about Akani as a good choice against rust, but also being great flavor, its parent is the Worcester Permain. This kind of broader resistance is really important. And also, we've gotten so into this New Zealand variety or this Australian, these are two Australians who just joined us, <laughs> good apple friends. Um, or this California variety, and we're going to grow it everywhere. That's not meant to be that way. When we go back 150 years ago to the heirlooms, they were chosen in part because they did well in that environment and that ecosystem with the way the rain happened. We need more of that again, getting back to bioregional cultivars. So all these things come together um, and will lead us into talking about an alternative, practical approach to dealing with disease. I just want to mention that um, myself, working with some other researchers, we have identified over a thousand heirloom apple cultivars um, that are here in southern Appalachia, southern and central Appalachia. So that's more than any other food shed in the U.S., Canada, and northern Mexico. So we've got a, a great base of heirloom diversity to work from here. Good. All right, five-minute break. Right. So this will be a five-minute one, folks, and then probably between quarter of seven and seven, we'll start to come. So let's get into how you practically do this. Yeah. First, we have to have what I call my NRA moment, which is <laughs> National Rifle Association. And often when people say, I'd love to plant fruit trees, but I don't want to spray, I say, it all depends on what you put in the sprayer. And so you don't have to fill that sprayer with toxins. You can spray it with good nutrition and biological reinforcement, and that totally changes the deal. So let's, let's add a little more complexity to that root growth chart we looked at earlier. Um, early on in the season, this is in your handout, but you don't have the color aspect. There's an important dynamic of the saprophytic fungi finishing, decomposing any leaves that are still on the orchard floor. So when I make my first holistic spray, it's just as much directed as the ground as the tree structure. Uh, also directed into the, the bark crevices because eggs that are overwintering are going to be subject to the action of neem. Um, that red curve represents that potential infection window of diseases, but it also represents the arboreal colonization coming back into play. So that happens naturally, gets depleted, but we want to start 
giving a boost to that competitive colonization. And the green curve just represents the mycorrhizal aspect of reaching out with the root flushes. Similarly, that mycorrhizal thing as we go deeper into the summer and fall just has become such an important dynamic. And then in the fall, the spreading of the compost, that's about decomposing leaves, but also tapping into that mycorrhizal feeder root dynamic. So again, my tasks, what I do when, is very much tied to what's going on with the tree and with the fungi. So when we talk about sprays, um, there's the notion of what percent active ingredient is in the spray, you know, and so on. And then again, a phosphate, that's some very toxic chemistry. And then sulfur, it's the sulfur percentage. My active ingredients here are biological reinforcement and deep nutrition. That sets the stage. And I'm going to achieve that by using trace minerals, fatty acids, and microbe diversity. And what I call my holistic core recipe consists of pure neem oil, fish hydrolysate, seaweed, and some type of microbial inoculant. So I'm going to get into the nuance of these particulars just so we totally understand what it is. And I'm also going to point out part of your handout is this holistic spray plan. Um, so as we get into this, you'll start to see how the pieces fall together. At first, it's around the bud stages. And part of the thinking here is, is what's that primary infection window? Uh, it's going to shift a little bit if you're dealing with different diseases, but you'll get to understand this chart a little better as we go through this. So first, liquid fish. When Patrick said fish emulsion, that is totally not the thing to use. He was misusing the word. But fish emulsion is the pasteurized um, brew of leftover fish parts where the fats have already been removed to go into pills in the health food store or to make fish oil for various reasons. So the good biological component has been taken away. It's pasteurized. And on the other hand, what's called fish hydrolysate, that word implies a cold processing of the whole fish. You still have the fats there. That is so biologically rich. So you, you can't just use fish emulsion and think you're doing what I'm saying. You have to understand what is fish hydrolysate. And there, there's two aspects of that that come into play. Question. It might be a temporary thing. It might be something that ultimately is not as available to us. Let me just first, I will answer that. So first, um, fish manufacturers can fool you and say this is liquid fish. That's such a generic term. So the word hydrolysate may or may not show up on it. So there are, there are certain brands like Neptune's Harvest and Organic Gem. Now Organic Gem is made from the dogfish shark which is caught in the trolling nets used when they're capturing haddock and cod, and, and we could debate the merits of, of that, but this is a waste fish that has just been killed and thrown back in the ocean. That doesn't sound very sustainable, but that's out there and it happens. Then there's products like Dram and Schaefer's Fisheries, which are out of the Midwest, and both of those are made with the Asiatic carp. That's an invasive species that we're trying to keep out of the Great Lakes. So it, it gives an economic motivator to capturing a fish that will cause much greater <coughs> problems. It's a, it's a good question you're asking because we should always think about those types of things. Another way that you can tell it's a true fish hydrolysate is because it's a fertilizer, it gives the NPK numbers for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And when that first number, which is the nitrogen number, is five, it's a fish emulsion. When it's two or three, it's a fish hydrolysate. So if you're not sure of the brand, that's another way that you get an indication of what is going on. Seaweed. So one of the ways I think about kelp um, is just as a great mega vitamin of all kinds of trace minerals, just because an ocean plant just contains many, many good things. Um, another aspect of seaweed. So seaweed comes in two forms. You're either going to get it as liquid kelp, which is cold processed and is going to be a little more biologically rich, 
uh, or as a seaweed extract where it's a dried powder that you can reformulate. So in, in terms of the, the trace minerals and particularly the cytokinins, which I'll explain in a minute, they're in both forms. But on the other hand, the polysaccharide content of liquid kelp has a real virtue in the spring. When trees are in bloom and a cold, a deeper freeze is predicted, um, polysaccharides act as a plant antifreeze. So in the case of apple, at 28 degrees, 10% of the open blooms will be lost to the cold, to the fact that they freeze. You know, 32 degrees, what's called a frost that blackens tomatoes and basil, that's not relevant in the orchard. But 28 degrees, 10% loss. At 25 degrees, just three degrees colder, 90% loss. So a blossom that hasn't totally committed and is still tightly wrapped has a little bit more cold resistance, but once it's open, those are the numbers that apply. Liquid kelp sprayed the afternoon before a freeze increases cold resistance by two to four degrees, and sometimes that can make all the difference in the world. But you won't get that aspect from the seaweed extract. Now, the other thing in seaweed and kelp is the cytokinin hormone. So cytokinin is, is what the plant, the seaweed, produces to hold to the bottom of the sea. That cytokinin, in turn, which is in the seaweed extract and in the liquid kelp, uh, acts as a flavonoid synthesis inducer. And flavonoids are one of the groupings of plant immune function. So seaweed serves directly to help boost the immune function of the plant as one of those elicitors. Sea minerals, um, there's things like C90. A much better version is something called C crop. Contains this really balanced nutritional profile of all the minerals that wash into the ocean and the seawater is evaporated. So this is also something that comes into play on this spray chart um, in a similar fashion. The biological reinforcement, um, whether it's an effective microbe formulation or compost tea, or people are also working with indigenous microbes in various fermentations and brews. Um, again, a lot of this research, it's not being done. So we're the, guy, we're the people who are exploring healthier, more local ways to grow things. The book was set up first around what I called the four holistic sprays of spring. And they totally tie to what I call the primary infection window, that business of getting on the airplane. And if it's cedar rust, it prolongs itself. But basically, it's based on bud stages. And those applications are made. So when I talk about bud stages, it's, it's the fruit bud and what it looks like. So we go through quarter inch green, half inch green. Sometime in that week on a warm day, I make the first application. And that is mostly sprayed on the ground just as much as the tree structure itself. Um, then somewhere going into open cluster early pink pink, I make a second application. And I'm giving a range of time there because remember fungal disease is driven by the rain. So if it's going to be a week of sunny weather, I, I might make that application if it's not going to bloom yet. Otherwise I might wait until it's a little closer to the rain event. So if your schedule is such that you can only work in your orchard on Saturdays, fine, you do what you can do. But if you have the ability to time things a little better, you can get into fine tuning it. Subsequently, there's sprays made at petal fall and seven days later in what is called first cover. So in orchard terminology, we go from bud stages, which are clearly identified. They vary. At my location is much different on the timing than here in terms of the calendar, but they're clearly identified because pink is pink wherever you are. On the other hand, once we get beyond petal fall and the fruit is starting to size, um, what was done traditionally was to cover the orchard every 7 to 10 to 14 days, typically it was 10, um, with the lead arsenate, with the sulfur, just to prevent whatever might happen. Now we're a lot more educated about disease cycles and, and timing now, but that terminology is still useful. So the first spray after petal fall is called first cover. Um, that totally straddles that primary infection window. Now, during that time, fruit trees bloom. And it's during bloom that I don't go and spray neem oil because it contains the azadiractins, which could impact the pollinators. 
I haven't explained how, how neem oil works in this respect, and we're not going to have time to get to those slides, so let me, let me do this. Azoderactins mimic the ectozyne hormone needed by insects to advance in their developmental stages. And so when neem is introduced onto the surface of the egg or the larva eats neem-covered leaf, it takes in this azoderactin aspect of neem and gets locked in that juvenile stage. So to really, really understand this, let's make it a little more human. All of us, at one point, were teenagers. And when we were 12, 13 years old, we listened to a certain kind of music. And that was okay because eventually we would discover Dizzy Gillespie and the Grateful Dead and Ella Fitzgerald and, and Sting and, and what have you, good music. <laughs> but that early phase, and let's say it's Lady Gaga, if no one ever turned off the iPod or the tape player during that developmental phase of our life, and we had to listen to Lady Gaga for 24, 48 continuous hours, we would succumb. That's what happens to insects. <laughs> it's the Lady Gaga effect. <laughs> and and <laughs> what you need to understand out of that is that as adults, we're beyond that. So when we talk about Kakulio, which is an adult making feeding stings and laying eggs in the fruit, neem doesn't have an impact there. It, it does on its cycle and maybe its return but not directly on that insect at that time when it's causing damage to our fruit. And again, that kind of understanding comes into play. I'm just telling you this early because I know we're not going to get to the insect portion of this thing. From there, um, beyond straddling, well, this is those bud phases, straddling that whole period, the bloom thing. That's what I was starting to talk about. During bloom, there are events that happen. It might be very moist because of rain or because of dew. Temperatures are in the 80s and you are much more likely to have potential of fire blight because the conditions are right at those temperatures for fire blight. During bloom, I might make an additional spray based on conditions. And I'm not going to include neem because I don't want it to impact the pollinators. And if particularly if it's my king blossom time, um, I also don't want to include the fish necessarily because I don't want to smother the flower parts. If it's later in the bloom, I might include the fish. But mostly what I do is double the microbe rate, double the seaweed weight, and in some instances I use another oil from India called Karanja. But that's kind of advanced, but it doesn't impact the insects. And a lot of this is experimental. You know, each year I have something new to share, and some years I don't have something new to share, but I keep trying different things. But that's one aspect. Another aspect is you have one of those major wedding events with scab. That means that for 10 days it hasn't rained. You're now in bloom. The spores have matured. There's going to be a big release, but you're seven days beyond your pink spray, and things are starting to be less high bricks because that impact of, of the materials you used is not as high. I also might come in then at that moment and spray a similar kind of mix. Microbes for the competitive colonization, seaweed for the isoflavonoid synthesis, and the Karanja because it's also got more isoflavonoid boost. It doesn't have the terpene boost of neem. That's a lot to take in and think about, but that's on the chart, and what I call a competitive colonization boost is all about needing a little bit extra during bloom because certain conditions come into play. These rates are given in your handout, and they're also given in your in on the website and in the book. But the key thing here is with the neem. Um, that can be applied at 0.5% concentration and not cause foliar burn, but any oil at a higher concentration during the growing season can cause foliar burn. So that, that's the important one to really not overdo. Neem oil is something that, so one, I'm talking about pure neem oil. So this is, the seeds are, are pressed of the neem tree and it produces this oil that's rich in all these compounds. Pure neem oil is not the same as a neem extract. So if you're ordering through an organic grower supply, um, you might see neem products, things like Neemix or Azer Direct, which are an extract and the fats have been removed, that which are good for the microbes. Um, the Azer Directins are concentrated, but you're also losing the terpenoid, kind of the immune function aspect. So those extracts, besides costing a lot more and not being as effective, um, 
are not what you want. You want the pure neem oil, which, you know, incidentally, um, in terms of like being concerned about health and is this bad for you, the hand lotion that we use has pure neem oil in it. The neem is something that's been used for thousands of years in Ayurvedic medicine, the medicine of the Indian, Indian continent, and also the ag their agriculture as well. So there's a lot of understanding about pure neem oil and, and it's, it's not like a toxin in some kind of big way. But neem oil below 60 degrees is like butter. So it needs to be liquefied by being brought out the night before to a warmer place. Maybe that means sticking in warm water the morning or the evening you want to spray. And it also needs to be emulsified, which means some soap needs to be added. So soaps like Ecover or seventh generation, any kind of natural liquid dish di um, soap works very well at that rate of one tablespoon per six ounces. Um, you'll eventually work out if you're spraying with a backpack sprayer, you need 2.5 ounces to a thing. So that's a third of a tablespoon. You, you can figure out the numbers to match what kind of sprayer you have. And this is something where you pour out the amount of neem, then you pour the soap into it, mix it, becomes more yellow and opaque, and you in turn pour that into a bucket of warm water, ideally, and you'll see that the f fat globules break apart. And yes, the oils float on the surface, but they're not in big globules. And that way you know you've added enough soap. So it's not hard to work with, but if you do it in a reverse order, you'll end up with these fats that congeal in your spray lines and, and you'll blame me and that that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing about neem is, as you work out your spray program, how you're gonna are you going to deal with just the primary infection window, the four sprays of spring, and are you happy with that? Or are you dealing with rots or rust, things that come later? You'll, you'll see I need so many sprays. Maybe it's six, maybe it's eight. And you'll know that you need so many backpacks to cover so many trees. And so you need so much neem at a time. And maybe so much neem at a time is a pint. And you have to buy two gallons for your particular orchard for your plans. So when you first liquefy the neem, and you bought it in a gallon amount, you should pour it into kind of a, a dose amount for each time you're going to spray. So that way you don't liquefy the neem over and over again because constituents start to break down. Um, that's what I call that batch size. And that's something you have to figure out for your scale of what you're doing. Another thing is to just know that there's a natural citrus-based degreasing soap called Citrusolve. So whenever I'm done spraying fats, and this includes the fish, this includes the neem, I flush the lines and run some citrusolve, diluted citrusolve in water through it and actually spray again just to flush my lines and make sure they're clean and I'm not building up fat layers inside there. When we talked about inducing systemic resistance, we listed lots of things. And so I have this core holistic recipe, but there are things that you can substitute. So if, if you're not into fish. Your, your own diet doesn't include meats. So you might use coconut milk or coconut oil. Now that's not local. Once I was asked by, when you do these talks with lots of different people, you get asked many things and you don't know what's gonna come at you. And this lady explained how she didn't have fish on her farm or nearby that she could get, but could she use liquid chicken? And I laughed, but then if you get to thinking about it, there's lots of fats and maybe that's a possibility. So it's, again, <laughs> there's room to explore here of, of what you're gonna work with. And another thing I like to tell people is, just because I can get neem today, or I might get regalia with the resveratrol, or this product or this product, that may not all be available as we come into the transition times. And so you have to kind of start thinking about, what do I have for resources? Okay. We go from that primary infection window into what I call the fruit sizing window. So in the case of apple, we're going from the size of a pea to a marble to a quarter. And it's during those 30 to 40 days that next year's bloom also forms. So when we talked about thinning, the fruit sizing window is when thinning happens. So now we go back to the specific diseases you're dealing with. So if it's cedar apple rust, that definitely carries into the fruit sizing window. Scab ends 
after the primary infection window if you did it right. And that may include those competitive colonization boosts. But another thing that happens in the fruit sizing window, we're going to start dealing with pests. So things like curculio and codling moth come on the scene. And so when we spray something like the kaolin clay for curculio, and I'm not giving you a lot of depth about the insects in this class because we're going to run out of time, but you can't spray that with the fats because it will stick the clay to the leaf. And the clay is something that's been refined to a really small size so that particles come off into the ear of cuculeo and into its belly button and into its armpits. And it makes it very uncomfortable and it stops wanting to sting your fruit to feed and to lay its eggs in your fruit. It wants to find somewhere else to go. So when you look at this spray schedule, you'll see a light coloration to the insect-directed sprays. And that's because they can't be made in the same tank mix. Whereas when I talked about the core holistic recipe of fish, seaweed, microbes, and neem oil, that's all mixed in the same spray tank. That's all done together. Another thing that comes into play, well, we'll get to it. After the fruit sizing window, we go to the fruit ripening window. So if you're dealing with black rot, there was that primary infection window around bloom time, and you have to deal with that. But if it's a really wet summer, and you're dealing with rots, there are things to do in the fruit ripening window. And those things are where we're going to get into the herbal, the different herbal teas. But, but this is basically a template of the timing of where th when these sprays are made. So if you look at the days in between, it's a lot tighter in the beginning because a lot more things are happening. By the summertime, I go to more of an every 14-day thing. And as a home orchardist, it may not matter to you that you have sooty blotch or fly speck, where if I'm selling the fruit, I want to limit the amount of that on my fruit, or at least get my people to understand, <coughs> my customers to understand it a little bit better. But in terms of sprays in the fruit sizing and fruit ripening window, we're now going to introduce the concept of the cuticle defense. So the cuticle is the waxy exudates that form on the surface of the fruit and on the surface of the leaf. In the case of the apple, you spit on the apple and you can polish it up, you're shining those waxes on the surface of the skin. They're naturally occurring. And that cuticle can be strengthened by boosting the levels of silica and calcium. And when it's basically like armor plating. So now, unlike in the bloom time, when we really want competitive colonization, in terms of dealing with rots, we really want a strong cuticle to resist the ability of the fungal organism to get into the fruit. And to do that is where we get into fermenting herbal teas. So this is all about herbs that are rich in silica and rich in calcium. And the principle here, just as Patrick told you, he can't just put comfrey in the 24-hour compost tea brew. It's, it's not drawing out that much of the nutrients. What has to happen is these herbal teas have to go through a fermentation breakdown. And it's through that fermentation that the nutrients within are made bioavailable. And this basically involves covering that tea, letting it sit for 7 to 14 days so that you get to the point where things have really broken down. And when I fork out the comfrey and the nettle, I see the stalk, but the leaf material has all dissolved and been taken up into the brew. Furthermore, and I'm going to introduce you to the garlic scapes, um, they help increase the ability to pass these nutrients through a membrane. So now what's going to be really beautiful is, is seeing how these plants in their cycle coincide with my need in the orchard to use these teas. So one of the, the greatest sources of silica is a plant called horsetail. There's different species of horsetail, but Mostly I'm talking about Equisetum arvens, which is the common horsetail. It gets to be about s 12 to 16 inches high. And um, this is a plant that first comes up and looks more like a fungus. And the male portion sporulates. And then the green bushy part comes up. And when the, the fronds are more tight, that's when we gather it for human medicine. But when those fronds start to spread, the level of silica goes skyrocketing up. And that point is right about the time of petal fall, when I start brewing these teas, when I start to enter the fruit sizing window. Um, what else? 
So this has great relevance for the summer diseases and for rots. I'm talking totally about the need for more silica. And I'm talking about a plant that grows in the, our ecosystems. We're not buying a product here. There are products you can buy for silica, but I'm trying to talk about how can we do this in a more local manner. Another plant with a lot of virtues is stinging nettle. So in, in herbal medicine, one of the sayings of herbalists is, if someone comes to you with a problem and you don't know what to do, definitely recommend nettle because it's going to help because of all that green goodness, all the phyto constituents just being nutrients for our body. So nettle goes through two phases in my mind. It goes through many phases and <laughs> maybe in its mind. But there's green nettle before it goes to seed. Green nettle is what we gather to make to dry for teas. It's what we make nettle greens with. And it's rich in all kind of phyto phytonutrients. So just as a fermented tea to boost the red beets, to boost foliage growth, it has a lot of value. It's very rich in calcium at that point. Then nettle starts to go into seed. And calcium levels are still pretty good, but now silica levels go skyrocketing up. So seeded nettle has a lot of silica content in it. That seeded portion of the nettle cycle is right, begins right about petal fall, when I want to call upon these teas for this specific purpose. Then there is the calcium to be found in comfrey. And yeah, question. No, the regrowth is going to have to go through the same process. The silica doesn't build up until it goes into seed. Right. So for me, I actually have both green nettle and seeded nettle at the same time because I have harvested some of the nettle for right. making tea. Yeah. And then I have the growth coming back, whether it's under or my trees, so there's nettle and some of it gets side. So I, I have access to both. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the seeded phase where you really get the silica. Is there any stage where it's too far along in that? I mean, do you have to get it before it um, sets seed, or does, can you get it even as late as when it sets seed? As late as when it sets seed is fine. You know, we don't dry that for tea because it's too high in silica, just like we don't gather horsetail once it's flattened for human use because it's too high in silica. Then there is comfrey. So here, definitely a lot of calcium um, and just a lot of green goodness as well. And uh, these nutrients are made bioavailable through the fermentation process. Now there's the garlic piece. Garlic um, has many medicinal properties for us as, as people, and whether you use raw garlic, cooked garlic, chopped garlic is, is part of that. And one of its properties is that garlic is a great expectorant. So when you're a parent with a one-year-old or a two-year-old, um, you can think about ways you might trick the infant to eat garlic to help them get through a flu, but probably not going to succeed. But it turns out if you simply cut a clove of garlic and take your infant's foot and rub the garlic in the bottom of the foot, mm -hmm. within a few seconds you'll smell garlic coming out of the pores up here. And that's because garlic, the organosulfur compounds in garlic, have this incredible ability to pass through a membrane. And they also have this ability to carry other nutrients with them and passing through a membrane. So right around pedophile, <laughs> actually maybe a couple weeks after, um, I grow a lot of hard neck garlic. Hard neck garlics get escaped. They don't form an actual flower and make seeds, but they clone themselves through the scape. And when you're growing hard neck garlic, you cut the scape off so that the garlic energy goes into the garlic bulb. So I cut a lot of scapes during this time I'm making the teas. And I include handfuls of garlic because that principle of carrying nutrients through a membrane is something I want to be part of my tea. I just love how the timing of these plants coincides with when I want to boost this cuticle defense. Reminder. I said the previous slide probably says something about calcium is hard to translocate, tr transpose from leaf to fruit. So if you're just doing a chop and drop, you're not going to get as 
You're working on the soil level. Right now I'm working on the foliar level with these okay. nutrients. Okay. You know, one of the things that's very common in IPM conventional orchards is foliar calcium. They're, they're using a different source where I'm going more with this plant-based approach. Um, but let's tie it in together a little bit more. Michael, a quick question about the garlic. Yep. Um, when we harvest it, we harvest it at like 40% leaf dieback. Would those leaves also have those compounds, the remaining green leaves? Sure. But, I don't know if you do this, but when I harvest my garlic and 40 to 50 percent yellowing, browning, um, I let them on the stalk for a couple weeks before I cut the bulb off. I got convinced by Ed Frazier, who grows my garlic seed when I don't, when ours doesn't do well, that to get it to cure well in this wet climate, just cut it off. That's not a good idea. Well, my, what, I'm, what I'm seeing is I know the nutrients yeah. concentrate in the bulb. Right, some come in, but it's a danger of our, our we had blue mold right. all over last year, so we're going to cut. So you have to, right, that's another thing. So now I've taken this herbal thing, <laughs> and I have taken it a little bit further. And I'm doing barrel batches. So in that uh, earlier slide, I showed you the five-gallon buckets and basically a loose pack of the bucket to the top and pour the hot water over it and then fill it with cold water and then let it sit. And I would do five gallons of each herb in my tank. Now I'm b doing a combination brew, and I'm utilizing the microbes more. And that basically means effective microbes are put in there. So I'm doing 50-gallon barrels at a time, and that might mean 20 pounds of horsetail and 10 pounds of seeded nettle and 20 pounds of comfrey and 10 pounds of green nettle in the other, the calcium brew. And with the effective microbes, I am introducing the dynamic of facultative organisms that help ferment, break down things. I'm introducing lactic acid bacteria, which if we go back earlier, we talked about lactic acid facilitating the movement of calcium and phosphorus. So that's an important player, because I am totally talking about wanting calcium into that leaf. Um, I am using humic acid in the silica tea. You could use that in the calcium tea as well. The calcium tea includes gypsum, which is the pellet of gypsum, and I just maybe add five pounds, but that breaks down and that adds more calcium. And I'm also utilizing two gallons of raw milk because milk has a big role in terms of calcium, but also feeding that biology. And if you have a magnesium um, shortage, you're seeing yellowing of a particular kind of yellowing of the leaf. You could also add Epsom salts. This would be a way to, to add the magnesium. But I'm doing this through the biology, so that really enriches this. And this is the first year I've done these bigger tea brews, but I'm really excited about how the leaves are looking. Again, if I could sell the leaves, I'd be rich. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, what is humic acid and what's its source? So humates, I don't know if I sh uh, there were sea deposit as much as a sedimentary deposit. And you can get things, uh, it's called leonardinite, yeah. and mana-free humates, which is the solid particles. Those, in turn, can, I don't know if they soak, I don't actually know how they make the humic acid, but out of, out of that sedimentary deposit, and I buy the humates in this, the solid form to put in my planting hole, um, and I mix those in the compost when I want to incorporate that maintenance rate of lime, um, you can also buy a humic acid formulation, and somehow they've drawn the humic principle out of the Leonardate, as I understand it. And I want to mention that Basically, they're agreeing now some of the best humates around are in worm casting. Okay. So if you add some of that to your tea, you could then be one fourth free of having to buy it in from. Yep. So great. You don't know how much. You have to experiment with how much. I don't know how much. I don't know. No more than twenty percent. I know that because the press grows over twenty percent. And worm castings are also going to introduce yet another microorganism dynamic. I haven't gotten into that level okay. of nuance. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter at this point. Okay. I mean, if you have a, a goat, and I don't know why you would, given what <laughs> we talked <laughs> about, <laughs> <laughs> then yes, <laughs> use the goat milk. <laughs> Did you have a question? 
And, and, and you'll see how those teas fit in here. I talk about the herbal teas um, and sea minerals, and that's basically in the fruit sizing window. And then if you're really concerned about these aesthetic fungi, which are the summer funguses, which are sooty blotch, which looks like a smoky haze, and fly speck, which looks like a fly pooped on it. These are fungi that feed exclusively on that waxy cuticle. So if I boost the cuticle strength, I'm going to see a little bit less of them. Now in truth, as a home orchardist, there's a couple of things you should understand about these. These are just basically a probiotic coating on your fruit that has, does no harm to you or your children or even those people you don't like. They're, they're just totally <laughs> innocuous. The second thing is, is if you really don't want to see them on the fruit that you're eating and you spit on it and you rub it off, it mostly rubs off. Mm -hmm. That's why we say aesthetic fungal disease. Now as a commercial grower, I'm only allowed to spit on so many apples that I'm going <laughs> to sell to other people. So I try to put some energy into the cuticle defense. This is the thing about milk, where I first encountered milk. Um, was Barbara Pleasant, who often writes articles for Mother Earth News, started using milk every 10, 10 to 14 days, um, diluting it uh, 1 to 10. And that's how she deals with brown rot exclusively. Now, I like the idea of putting the milk in the fermented tea and thinking about cuticle defense. But this is another approach that if brown rot is your big issue, maybe you're not brewing this tea. I'm just giving you the pieces. But milk has relevance. Uh, grape growers are using it for powdery mildew. Again, that 1 to 10 um, dilution. Um, people are using whey. If you have access to whey or you're a yogurt maker, you might have that liquid portion. That might be what you put in your tea. Y you can vary this recipe. I want to stress that. It is a lot of latitude to basically bring into play what are the things that induce systemic resistance? How do I get nutrition into my tree, into my fruit? And what are the players? Lactic acid bacteria being one. So there's plenty of room, and, and hopefully those of you who get really into this, you communicate with me so I can help spread the word of this works, this doesn't work. Someone had great luck with this. But it's about finding what local resources you have. Then another part of this is just managing inoculum levels. So when I talked about, gave examples of different diseases, I was talking about they each had a launching pad. Scab is those fallen leaves. Um, those fallen leaves, the less of them that are there in the spring, the less potential inoculum you have to infect your trees. And yes, it can blow in from two miles away if the winds are right, or from the neighbor's tree who never prunes them and they're always scab ridden, and the neighbor doesn't want you to do anything about it. Um, but mostly, the source of inoculum is going to come from the leaves at the base of your trees. So let's do something about that. People use the words fall sanitation or orchard hygiene, but I like to use the term stirring the biological stew. And what I do is three of the four following steps. Some years I might do four. So if I need to lime, this is talking about a maintenance rate of lime, so that 400 pounds of per acre, if you have trees with a 16 radius diameter fungal duff, um, that's four pounds per tree. It's a sprinkling. So when 20, 40 percent of the leaves have fallen, that's when I'm going to do that rate of lime because research has shown that lime on the surface of the fallen leaf inhibits the ability of the scab fungus to form those spore sacs for next year on the order of 50 to 90 percent. So if I don't need lime to boost my pH again, you know, I'm not going to do that that fall. But if I know I need it, I'm going to wait till that moment because now I get another aspect covered. And I'm covering the first leaves that have fallen that are going to see the warmest of the days to have that opportunity. Leaves continue to fall. I start to get to my second all-out effort at mowing. And when I mow in the fall, it is a complete area-wide mowing because I want to totally reduce bowl cover. I want them exposed to hawks and pine martens and foxes. I don't want places to hide. I'm also, at that point, chopping up leaves. There's, yes, there's still some leaves on the tree. I can't get to everything at the end. I'm starting the process. And in chopping up leaves, 
50 to 90 percent of the spore sacs will be destroyed by the mere mechanical action of that chopping. And on top of that, there's time to spread the compost. We talked about the rate. And so when I blow the leaves in, or you might rake the leaves in, <coughs> uh, I'm basically forming a fungal cake in the fungal duff zone of that tree. And when I spread the compost, you know, it's not out there in the aisle. It's not up against the trunk. It's in that whole zone that makes up the fungal duff. And that little bit just increases biological activity, earthworm uh, activity as well, and more leaves are broken down. And so by the time all this is complete, you know, there's just going to be a lot less inoculum come spring. And you're going to have what I call a clean orchard. And then on top of that, I do a fall holistic spray. And the fall holistic spray is, is important in a few ways. So this is a spray that consists of the liquid fish at double the rate I have in the core recipe because it's a ground op application mostly. Um, I double the rate of effective microbes. And I like to include neem oil if I have enough as well. And what I'm doing in the fall holistic spray is I'm spraying the tree structure. So any leaves remaining now have a higher fat content. They're more likely to be consumed when they eventually do fall. And you'll find um, with apple in particular, um, some leaves can really stay on there for a long time. So I've, I've just increased the odds that they'll decompose even though I've done the other work on the ground level. In addition, I am spraying the tree structure. So some disease organisms overwinter in bark crevices and bud scales. I'm having an impact there. If codling moth is an issue, remember where codling moth goes into the bark, scaly bark. And so my fall spray and my spring spray have an impact on the molting cycle of codling moth. It's, it's, it's much more relevant than you think. Also, codling moth uh, also will pupate in weed cover and on the stalks of plants underneath the tree. So when I'm spraying the ground, decomposing leaves, I'm actually, over time, having a significant impact on the pest cycle, and codling moth numbers are going to be dropped as well. And those fats are also just fueling that biological action. So all that comes together in the banner of what I call the fall holistic spray. Quick question about that, Michael. I know you're, on your scale, you're using the tractor and the sprayer, but I also have seen pictures of you with the backpack. Using the backpack. Photo ops. Photo ops, okay. <laughs> well, you, well, you've got some experience. Uh, you know, to spray a tree to dripping with a backpack sprayer, that would take half a backpack, wouldn't it, pretty much? Or Depends on the size of the tree, and yes. Yeah. So you have to work that out. Yeah. And, you know, when you're spraying with a backpack, you're not just coating the surface, but you also want to try to hit the undersides That's where the stomates yeah. are, so that's an important yeah. part of yeah. absorption. Um, other nuances of backpacks. Um, if neem oil is in there, neem oil, you know, if it just sits in a bucket, no, it doesn't, <coughs> doesn't have to be all warm water. But I just, in the mixing phase, is yeah. partly some warm. But oil's going to float to the top just sitting in a bucket. Or if you're spraying the kale and clay, trying to build up a nice coat on your tree, well, clay will settle. So backpacks don't have that mechanical agitation. They don't have a recirculation loop. And this is where it gets to be fun as an organic home orchardist, because your neighbors are watching you, OK? <laughs> and, and you say you're doing safe things, but there you are making your tree all white. Even when they sprayed DDT, they didn't make the tree all white. You couldn't see it. But you're going out there and doing that. And on top of that, in order to agitate your backpack sprayer, um, you have to learn to pump and jump as you do it. It's a good exercise. <laughs> but this is what your neighbors are seeing. Or maybe you do the slosh. But either way, you have to keep things mixed up. Otherwise, it's only the last bits of spray that have really the neem concentration, and then it's going to be too high. I have no clue if I've answered your question. Well, you, <laughs> well, you have. Uh, but I got one other in, in, your, in your holistic book. I think you said that there's no really good home scale agitated pump sprayer on wheels. Is that pretty much you know, something that. So if you buy one of those 15 to 25 gallon sprayers and you're using like a ATV to or lawn tractor to either pull it because it's on a trailer or it's on a skid. Part of your agitation is just kind of stop and go driving because they, they don't come with that. But as far as pulling something yourself, if you don't have that, I mean, there's, there's nothing small scale out there that's. 
Well, that 20, 25 gallon is there, and then, yeah, th that's a trickier place to, to find something that's going to be as effective. Okay. So what's wrong with the backpack sprayer? The backpack sprayer is great if you have 6, 12, 24 trees, and particularly not huge trees. <laughs> but once you get to a certain scale, and particularly if you're growing taller trees, it can be harder. I mean, once you fill that backpack for the eighth time, you start to think, well, maybe eight times okay, but at the twelfth time, <laughs> you start to wonder, ah, and now it's like, I'm not going to bother with that pink spray. <laughs> that's too many backpacks. And so you don't necessarily get it done because it's not as fun. So that's it's something to think about. Pause one second. I just have to change battery. Sorry, you guys. Once. This may not need to be filmed, but just consider looking for um, a decent battery-powered electric sprayer because it'll be a lot easier. You'll be able to go further if you're going to use a backpack sprayer. And they often have a higher PSI to get you better dispersion and better adhesion. So it's just, it's worth considering. I mean, the real expensive electric, I mean, gas motor ones are spectacular. You're looking at 700 bucks and a big pain to carry around. And one backpack sprayer brand is, is the Hudson SPI. And they make a, a piston type pump, which gives you slightly higher pressure to reach higher. Um, but it's kind of like a hybrid in that it doesn't clog as readily. And one other comment about pressure was when you're spraying biology, you don't go for like the mist blowing pressure and the really fine droplets because the biology has to fit through the openings of the sprayer and spraying it more like 100 PSI is, is appropriate for biology. So you, sprayers, some of them can put it out there at 200 pounds per square inch, but that's not good for the biology. So again, it's, there's all kinds of nuance in the, this, this piece and understanding, thinking about it in it's terms of... The that I use is basically a mist blower. Yeah. And it's not going through any, any major, you know, it's, it's a dripping little hose. It's dropping its drips and you're getting tons of air. And it'll be protoplasm mushed if I hit it close up, but if I stay far enough back that it floats in, it can be 200 PSI, fine droplets, and stick. You know? So I've used compost tea with mist blower and had good effect. Okay. And, um, but you cannot spray close up. You have to be way back. It has to be able to decelerate before it lands. Okay, that makes sense, but correspondingly, I, d I do 100 PSI. Yeah, no, I, I think 100 is fine, too. I don't and if you have an air blast sprayer, you want to use a larger size nozzle, so you're not Right, and Squeezing I, don't, I don't recommend the other one because it's really a pain to use and it's very expensive. They are for the size most people are doing here. If you're doing a lot of space and for some reason you can't use something like yours, then that one you, you know, it just kind of fits in between. It's not like a pump sprayer, but it's not as expensive or as hard to get to, and it's a great big one like you and uh, like we use here too. And that, my great big one is 100 gallons. It's not as much greater big ones than that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, another thing is. So I, I spray the orchard, there's a certain schedule to it. I usually hit the compost piles. I always hit the raspberries and blueberries just as I hit the fruit trees. I also hit the garlic and the tomatoes and the potatoes. This applies equally to the garden. You know, it's, it's just good stuff. So you're dealing with late blight or whatever disease, this is just promoting health in the way nature works in all these different settings. Yes, the fall holistic spray. <laughs> I said all that. This is when, if I've run out of affected microbes, I might use air unaerated compost as a substitute because it's a ground-directed spray. Yes, the leaves are up there, but the tree's gone dormant, so it's, it's a different scenario. And, you know, this just is probably my, my one pristine moment of the year where it's not, uh, like, looking wild and out of control. And the Things have been cleaned up and chopped and all that wonderful biological action is going to take place as the first snows come. You know, often, you know, I have a push mower in the lawn. I still, yes, I confess, I still mow some grass. <laughs> um, but part of my maintenance of that mower is to run out the last tank of gas and then I'll go around the trees and just blow things in to kind of finalize my fungal cake. That's what you see with the effect of the circles around these trees. And then there's the spring, and you've just, right now we're in the summer, but sometimes I'm teaching this workshop in, in late winter, early spring. 
Uh, this is for the obsessive compulsive people. If you haven't done the fall holistic spray and you haven't chopped things into bits and you haven't spread compost, you can also go out there and flip every leaf <laughs> over because the spore stacks form to point one direction and you can shoot them all into the ground. Mm -hmm. So th there's something for everybody in orcharding. <laughs> but regardless of the disease we're talking, yes, question, I'm sorry. So I have a 100 gallon tank and probably each tank is like an hour. That, so with my three acres of orchard, well some of the trees are young. Right now it's, it's usually three sprays until I warm the neem, until I finally clean the lines with Citrusol. Mm -hmm. That's probably a four hour shot for that. What I have three acres. Producing trees, they're probably on the order of about 200. And then another 140 or so that are just coming into bearing or even just recently planted. So regardless of the disease, you know, there's nuance to know about its particulars, when its <coughs> infection window lies, where its launching pad is. But regardless, nutrient, deep nutrition, and competitive colonization is the way nature works. And for a long time, we've been working with the idea of fungicides to do that clean slate mentality and kill things. And it just induces further problems. And we get apples that are emptier, fruit that doesn't have the same medicinal virtues. And this just opens the possibilities to doing things so much more locally and in a healthy way that's good for us and good for the orchard and good for the ecosystem. And that's basically the basis of the holistic approach. Um, I think rather than getting into this next section, which is like an hour plus long, I'll do questions to finish until you want to do the dinner moment, which is, can we do questions for like 10 minutes? Sure. Okay. Uh, two, two questions are uh, thinning fruit. Uh, I thin mine, of course. I've got a small, much smaller thing than yours. Uh, the thinning apples, what's ideal? Because, and one of the, the, the other part of the question is, my favorite fruit, with, uh, apple, which is the gold rush, has been just bearing every two years. I mean, can thinning make a big impact on that? Uh, I'm trying to get it into every year bearing. Or? Timely thinning, by which I mean in that 30 to 40 days after petal fall, has an effect on return bloom. Okay. So here's how this works. When an apple tree sets a lot of fruit, from the tree's perspective, there are 10 seeds in every fruit if it's been fully pollinated. And so every blossom cluster has five potential fruits. And so that's 50 seeds. And when almost every blossom cluster has set most of its fruit, that abundance of seeds leads to a buildup of gibberellic acid hormone right at the tip of the spur where the fruit is. The tip of the spur is where the flower cells for next year's are going to form. So this is peaches, cherries, they're totally different. But apples and pears, this is how they form fruit and the moment they do it. So when you come in and thin enough, and I'll explain what that is, you reduce the levels of gibberellic acid hormone plus allow the nutrients and hormones to get to both places, the developing fruit and the meristem. Thinning enough is a difficult thing to do because with something like Gold Rush, you are needing to remove as much as 80 to 90% of the set fruit. You know, that is not easy to do. I mean, in theory, I can say that number, but that is not easy to do. Because when the apples are this size, it's like, oh, I could have a few more. Now here's the other piece. Every apple, requires a certain photosynthesis capacity. That photosynthesis capacity is, is numbered in that it takes 20 to 30 plus leaves to develop an apple fully in terms of fruit sugars, flavor, and size. And 20 to 30 plus leaves, no one besides whoever originally counted these leaves <laughs> counts leaves. But when you look at a branch, 
you can kind of take your hand and say, photosynthesis factory, 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 factory. This branch could have five fruit. So another way this is explained is with the idea that thin the fruit so there's an apple every four to six inches along the branch, which six inches basically means this cluster has an apple, this cluster does not, this cluster has one. So when I go about hand thinning varieties, I'm taking into account a quick rough assessment of this branch could have so many, and, and that becomes intuitive. You don't do that every time. Um, but I'm also tuned into the fact that maybe this branch has no fruit on it, or just one. There's extra photosynthesis energy for somewhere else. Or it's spotty bloom, and here's two, two apples together in a cluster, but then there's cl eight clusters with no fruit. I'm going to leave those two apples. I'm not going to be rigid about one apple per cluster. But when I'm thinning a heavy setting variety, my first thinning consists of thinning to one fruit per cluster. And now remember that king blossom? If that got pollinated, that apple in the center is going to be just a little bit bigger. So that's the one I'm going to keep if I don't see any insect damage on it or scab spotting. As much as I said, a few spots are good. I, at this point, if I see a spot, it's going to be removed. And on some varieties, that thinning to one per cluster is enough. And again, if it's a very erratic set, I'm going to leave more than one per cluster. Then I let some time pass, and I, by that I mean a week, 10 days, two weeks, and I go back to that tree. And at that point, I might see some sawfly damage. I don't think... You might have saw a fly down here. You might not. Not much of an issue here. It's coming. Yeah. <laughs> but the but you'll right see right some cuculeo. You'll yeah. see some codling moth damage. So now another aspect of thinning is a, is a great opportunity to balance the pest dynamics at your orchard. So codling moth, cuculeo are definitely after that sizing fruit. And if you see a hole in the apple with frass coming out, likelihood is that if you cut that little fruitlet open, you'll find the larva, the pest in there, if you're thinning in a timely manner. Now, if you're thinning 40, 60 days after petal fall, that larva has possibly and likely gotten out of the fruitlet and is already pupating in the soil. But if you're doing it in a timely manner, the larva's in there. Don't throw those in the ground, because these are pests that pupate in the soil. Well, not codling moth, but cuculeo does. So instead, if your orchard is not really in balance yet, in my orchard, it's, it's the pest dynamic is pretty much taken care of. I still have to do things, but it, it's between the, the clays and the use of neem over several years, it's, it's, there's much more of a balance. So I'm dropping fruit to the ground. But if you have a lot of infested fruit, you gather them in buckets. And you don't go put it on a cold compost pile because that's putting them back to get into the soil. If you have chickens or hogs, you could feed them to them. But we don't all have chickens or hogs. So what's fun to do is you take the buckets of infested fruitlets and during the early hours of the morning, you drop them here and there on the hard packed paved road. And then cars drive over them all day long and these big brown circles appear. And your neighbors know it's you, but they can't prove it. But <laughs> that's another part of, of how you, you start to knock back the numbers. And then you have much better odds for the next year. And it might take two, three seasons, where you st and part of this balancing also involves some of the organic options of, of things you might spray specifically for a certain pest. But eventually, the idea is to get to a place where there's more of a balance. And so, yeah, there's still the work of thinning, but it's not in the same degree. I've thinned three times already on the gold rush, and I'm looking at them now this big going, God, there's way too many. Size-wise, would it help me to thin even at this stage? Yeah, after the 30 to 40 day window, further thinning means that the apples remaining will get bigger. Okay. And another thing about thinning and taking 80 to 90% off, you can have a full size tree and pick 16 bushels of golf balls. And a lot of the golf balls probably will have moth damage because when fruit are touching each other, moths, second generation moths hide in there and do surface feeding. Um, so if you do leave two apples in a cluster, you know, I try to pick two apples that are pointing away from each other uh, rather than touching. But if you thin, those 16 bushels probably become 17 or 18 bushels of apples this size because the energy goes into fewer. So 
You just have to learn that, and it's hard to learn to take off enough. So the, the moment to thin peaches, the first moment, part of that method, is on the peach branch, it kind of does flowers in a triad kind of way. It's, it's they're not all like on the top of the branch, they're, they're shooting off in different directions. And so just going out there with a stiff bristle brush in spring when it's in bloom, you also have to be heartless now because it's pretty. Um, and just going along each branch and knocking off a third of the flowers wow. is a quick way. You don't have to, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a quicker way than hand thinning all the fruit. Um, some people use a, a plastic wiffle ball bat similar to do the same. That method does not work with apple and pear because their flowers grow in clusters. They're not like stiffly off in different directions on the branch. And no one thins cherries. Plums, it's not a bad idea. Um, but it's not something you usually probably will get to. And no one thins berries. <laughs> you don't thin berries. And the second time you thin after you well, well, now it's about going out there and you're going to leave earlier peaches every six to eight inches along the branch and later peaches every eight to ten inches and it's taking them off by pinching. So this is the concept of biodynamic tree paste. You're, yeah, you've got your exactly. recipe. The core recipe is, is really half a native clay and half fresh cow manure. And people do variations. They add equisetum. Some people add sand. But I'm going to just take those two aspects. The native clay is something that helps rejuvenate tissue. Um, just like the comfrey tea, the allotonins that help repair my bones also make bark healthier. Um, but here the clay is about rejuvenating tissue, and it's the fresh cow manure, or it could be compost, but that's the microbe component. And that's just like bending over and putting earth into the lesion of a chestnut blight. So the biodynamic tree paste is not something I've done religiously on every trunk, but I mix up a slurry and use it wherever I see cankers or like bark injury. Um, I don't think that that has much impact on codling moth. It might have an impact on, because you're adding diatomaceous earth, it might have an impact on something like lesser peach tree borer, but it may not. So we haven't talked about the insects and the borers. Um, but if you're happy with the results, I mean, it doesn't rule it out. I'm, I'm just a conduit. I don't know everything. I just think about how these things work. I, again, codling moth is like behind the bark scales, and you're probably not penetrating there. Where the neem oil... You know, something about neem oil and the fats. Does poplar grow down here? Or poplar? What? Poplar, so, poplar. you know. Poplar. 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 Well, the poplar tree um, is a great example of this. So it has a green bark. And so in the winter, there's no leaves, you know, they're off the tree. The poplar tree is actually photosynthesizing. The bark can photosynthesize. Mm -hmm. And that's true of other tree barks as well. And those fats that I'm applying are absorbed into the bark. And so that's another means of, of getting nutrition into the tree, that bark has more relevance than we think in terms of the tree doing the phytochemical thing. No, I think the slurry is a separate thing. I think it's about treating cankers where disease organisms overwinter, particularly something like perennial canker, or uh, there are people who run that slurry very thin through a sprayer. They're dealing with anthracnose, which is, is another disease, but it's in very small lesions on twigs. 
um, which that's hard to get with a paintbrush, where what you're describing is painting the trunk. But no, I'm, I'm just, we're talking about bark, and it got me remembering to say about the fatty acids and that aspect. Well, since you mentioned borers, um, the only thing I found to prevent them was uh, raw tobacco leaves around the base of the tree. So is that valid? I mean, do you think that's valid? I mean, I assume it works. If you're seeing good effect, that's great. People have used nicotine as part of a spray program. My approach to borers, so borers come as a beetle type, which is the flat-headed and the round-headed borer. And that beetle lays, the round-headed beetle lays up to seven eggs around the circumference of the trunk at the soil line, mostly. Flat-headed borers go into sunburn, damaged places on the trunk. And then the peach tree is subject to the peach tree borer and the lesser peach tree borer, and those are moths. But again, its eggs are laid, and the borer goes in to eat the cambium. So my primary approach is a botanical trunk spray of neem oil. And this is made at 1% to 2% concentration because I'm not spraying foliage. I'm not going to. And in, in my case, it's on my chart. Those sprays are made in mid-June, early July, and if it's a bad situation, early August because that's the timing of when the beetle is laying eggs. With the peach tree borer, that timing shifts because it comes a little bit earlier. Um, but this is a borer. Fats are absorbed into the bark. That's where the, the borers are. And the azoderactins break down the development of that grub to go to the next stage. And the fact that neem is applied when the females are laying the eggs, there's an egg deterring, an egg laying deterring quality to neem because it's, it's, it's not subject to azoderactins, but it senses them. Okay. Last question. Okay. Well, um, in a group setting. I guess one that it seems like you kind of answered by default is about thinning, that you just basically have to do it manually by hand, is what you're saying with apples. There's not like any it other magical way. No, it. if you're growing commercially and you have 100 Fuji trees or 100 Gold Rush trees, not every variety necessarily sets heavily, but there are ones that do. And it's just overwhelming. After King Blossom opens, and there's a day or two of what seems to you really good pollination activity, and bees do a lot more than we think, but you have to like, in your spirit, feel like they did it, because you can't see fruit yet. Then about day three of bloom, and maybe day six, you go and spray table salt on those varieties that it's in the book about the, the, the rates. That burns the fragile flower parts. And you go from this most beautiful moment to turning things brown. So you have to be kind of a heartless bastard <laughs> <laughs> to do this. Um, or you can use vegetable oil to smother the flower parts. And the reason these methods work without interfering with fruit being set is once the bees have delivered the pollen to the fruit, the flower, a pollen tube starts to grow. And so the pollen's in there. It's not going to be smothered. It's not going to be burned out. It's deeper down going towards the ovaries where the seed will form. So you can do that. But you know, if it's a more sporadic setting variety, you know, I wouldn't do an orchard wide approach. And if you're a home orchardist with three trees that happen to set really heavy, you just put in that effort. It's like a meditation. And it's a good time to drink hard cider. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I could slow it down one more, because I don't know if I missed it or um, it didn't come up, but uh, what are your thoughts on serenade as far as microbial dealing with microbes? So serenade is a product sold by a company called AgriQuest, and they took a soil organism, a subtilis bacillus, a specific subtilis bacillus, and they ferment that organism. Now, I don't know what that means, but the fermentation process puts that organism under stress. And in response to that stress, that organism produces antimicrobial compounds. So one of those groupings is the iturins. That I think that's the one that works on the fungal aspect. 
then there's other compounds that work on the bacterial aspect. So in tests, serenade is shown useful against fire blight, but not so much against scab. And I'd have to look it up to, to go further than that. Um, so serenade is an option in a fire blight program um, in terms of not so much colonizing the blossom, but an alternative to antibiotics and in introducing compounds that work against bacteria. Fire uh, serenade has potential use against the brown rot. Um, again, because it has antifungal compounds as part of its chemistry. Uh, I'm not sure if organisms actually are part of the serenade delivery as much as these byproducts of organisms. Um, so I don't think of it as a competitive colonization type thing. But you have, in terms of fire blight, alternatives in that it's organisms, particularly yeast. Blossom Protect is a particular strain of yeast. I mean, when you hear about a product, someone's patented it, done enough testing to, to validate it, and they want a certain amount of money for that. But a crowd is a crowd, no matter who's in the crowd. And so in terms of fire blight, that's the approach. And for me, the brown rot piece, the serenade has more relevance at the blossom phase, where the silica calcium is, is more, I mean, Competitive colonization is relevant to brown rot too, but the silica and calcium is a bigger part. Okay, grow fruit, North Carolina. Thank you. Thank you.